My name's Dr Phil Porter. I'm a, a glacier scientist. I study how glaciers and ice sheets are responding to environmental changes, uh, predominantly the warming we're seeing and also changes in snowfall, um, which is obviously the main source of nourishment for glaciers and ice sheets. Uh, I'm doing a voiceover for these slides which I presented to North Arts District Council uh, before Christmas and also to the Northwest employers uh, in January uh, because I know there are a number of uh, people who were not able to attend those events and so wanted to hear the presentation so I will try and stick to the, uh, the script as it were that I delivered during those public talks. Um, before I start, just to mention the structure of the talk, I'll be starting off by discussing some of the research I am undertaking and have been undertaking in the Arctic. Uh, and I'll also discuss some of the issues uh, related to shrinking uh, glaciers and ice sheets in, in the Himalaya uh, as well. Uh, I'm then going to cover some of the common myths and misconceptions that seem to fly around, particularly when it comes to glaciers and how they're responding to environmental change uh, and then finally I'm going to take my scientific hat off uh, and discuss some of the actions that we can be taking so that's members of society but also policy makers uh, to try and deal with this issue and try and mitigate some of the impacts. Um, so two-thirds of the talk will be based on, on my scientific work and then the, the last third approximately uh, I'll move on to more policy issues and perhaps um, a more personal opinion on these things. Now I've been working in the Arctic for almost 30 years now. Uh, I've been there most years, most summers usually uh, over that period and working there is a double-edged sword because on the one hand extraordinarily privileged to work in some of the world's true last wilderness areas and, and it is a wonderful privilege but of course it comes with a, a nasty sting in the tail in that every year I'm witnessing um, profound and accelerating change uh, and the acceleration in change has been particularly noticeable over the last decade or so uh, and perhaps more disturbing than all that is coming back to the UK uh, and seeing the issue not necessarily being taken particularly seriously um, and actions not necessarily being taken um, to try and deal with this issue. Uh, but before we get on to those sorts of policy considerations, where I work in the Arctic is where my mouse pointer is now on the screen. Uh, this is the Svalbard Archipelago, the largest island in the group is Spitsbergen. And the reason we work there, and it is a centre for um, glacier research, is that the glaciers of Spitsbergen are relatively warm for their latitude, for the same reason we in the UK are relatively warm for our latitude. Uh, we're kept warm by the Gulf Stream, the North Atlantic Drift, um, and that means that the glaciers in Spitsbergen are if you like, not on the margins of glaciation per se, but they are sensitive to any increase in temperature because they are already uh, in a relatively warm climate. And the second reason we work in Spitsbergen is the glaciers there are relatively small. If we compare them to some of the monster sized systems we see in Greenland. Uh, now, small glaciers are logistically obviously easier to work on. Uh, but the main reason they're of interest is because small glaciers respond much more rapidly to environmental change, so changes in temperature, changes in snowfall, uh, than large glaciers. Now why Arctic glaciers matter, uh, or perhaps I should call this slide why Spitsbergen Arctic glaciers matter, well, the Arctic as a whole is warming at more than double the global average, and I think I'm right in saying it is the most rapidly warming part uh, of the planet presently. Now, one of the key reasons for that is uh, diminishing Arctic sea ice, which has been facing a downwards trend, obviously ups and downs between years, but, but the trend is very much one of uh, shrinkage since monitoring began in the uh, late 70s and so effectively we're losing the, the, the spatial extent of that white umbrella uh, at the top of the planet. 
Uh, as I mentioned just now, Arctic glaciers, particularly small ones, are very sensitive indicators of climate change. And when I say climate change, I'm talking not just about warming, but also about changes to snowfall inputs to those systems, because glaciers are, uh, or glacial ice, is nothing more complex than compressed snow. Uh, we are seeing profound and accelerating changes, as I mentioned, um, particularly over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, and there are knock-on consequences for shrinkage of Arctic glaciers, delivery of water with the obvious sea level implications where ice is on land and running into the oceans. But also there are impacts in terms of delivery of sediments and nutrients to marine ecosystems. We also have reduction in albedo, so albedo meaning the reflectivity of a surface. If we're diminishing the amount of white, snow and ice in the Arctic, then clearly we are not reflecting as much of the sun's energy away from the surface and that induces further warming. And that ties into this reduction of sea ice cover as a, as a mode of warming because we are exposing that darker ocean surface which absorbs energy, uh, having a lower albedo. And then also uh, glaciers are very effective at chemical weathering and without wanting to get into electron hydrochemistry, uh, as a chemical weathering takes place beneath glaciers, uh, carbon is sequestered from the atmosphere. Uh, so glaciers are an important carbon sink uh, and clearly if they are reducing in size and extent then the capacity of that carbon sink uh, is also reducing. Now we work in a place called Neolisand, uh, it's one of several locations but this is the key location. Um, it is a centre for research, uh, it is the world's most northerly inhabited permanent settlement and uh, a whole host of research going on here but, but a, a, a sizable proportion of that research is uh, looking at environmental change and related issues. And I'd just like to point out on this photo you can see the open ocean here uh, on, on the left where my mouse cursor is uh, and you can see the difference in albedo. You've got that dark ocean surface and then the white snow covered areas. And bear in mind this photo was taken in March uh, now the sun comes up in February for the first time, so this is very early in the melt season and yet you can see the fjord, which as recently as 12, 13 years ago would have been full of sea ice, uh, is now completely free of ice and, and that has been the case uh, for at least um, the last decade. Uh, so profound changes there and you can probably see that there's relatively little snow uh, on the ground where it hasn't been removed from uh, the roadways. So um, it's not just about temperature, uh, it is also about snowfall. Now this is the same location in summer and being the world's most northerly permanently inhabited settlement we have the world's most northerly post office which is what you can see in the photo here. Um, this is a bit of a tourist attraction because occasionally in the summer months um, small cruise ships dock in the Ollison and everyone runs to the post office to get their postcard stamped <coughs> and posted from the world's most northerly post office. And of course, uh, being the world's most northerly permanently inhabited settlement, we've got the world's most northerly everything. The world's most northerly pool table, would you believe? Uh, world's most northerly bar, um, jacuzzi, uh, you name it, it's there and it's the world's most northerly. When I say jacuzzi I should add it's one of these uh, very small simple outdoor ones that holds about two people. So <laughs> we're not living in uh, total luxury. And uh, would you believe it the world's most northerly train. Now this is a, uh, ironically given that the other Sunday is now a focus for climate change, environmental change research, it used to be a coal mining settlement and this train was used to take wagons from the coal mines to the dock for subsequent shipment and it's become a bit of a, a tourist attraction uh, in its own right and it was taken off for refurbishment a few years ago uh, obviously standing outside through the arctic winter uh, is pretty harsh uh, and here it is just arriving back having been renovated refurbished and given a, uh, a fresh coat of paint 
Now, why are we interested in glaciers uh, and what are we trying to do in the Arctic? Well, one of the key research projects I'm involved in is trying to predict uh, how much meltwater glaciers will produce and when they will produce it. You know, because this is critical in predicting how glaciers are going to respond to warming and changes in snowfall input. Now, easy said than done though. It is relatively easy to measure the inputs to a glacier system. So this is a slice through a glacier. The main input of energy being solar radiation, the main input of mass being snowfall. Um, outputs, the main output for Arctic glaciers is meltwater runoff. Um, but the issue here is trying to link the inputs to the outputs because what we have inside the glacier is a complex network of tunnels, passages, caverns, etc which channel and store water and will to a large extent dictate how quickly meltwater generated up here on the ice surface will make its way out of the front of the glacier. So the challenge is to understand what's going on inside the glacier uh, where we have no knowledge of the workings of a system in the geosciences we refer to it as a, a black box. And so the challenge here if we're going to understand how glaciers are going to respond to warming is to understand how that black box operates. Uh, so that's what, what, what the primary aim is of much of the research I undertake. So here we have a weather station on the surface of a glacier near Neolosund. Uh, as I mentioned this is the input side so measuring radiation input predominantly uh, relatively easy to do. Uh, this is the same glacier on the output side, so this is our hydrological gauging station in the main meltwater channel. Now these things are relatively easy to, to do, easy to measure uh, with uh, good levels of accuracy. Now what is harder is to get inside the black box to actually really understand how the system works out of sight. And one technique we use is to inject fluorescent dye into surface rivers on the ice surface. So that's what's going on in this photograph. Uh, and here you can see the dye flowing down a surface river. Uh, it will enter the glacier via a vertical hole, just up here in the top right, a vertical hole called a moulin. Um, and we install the fluorometer, which is a device to measure the fluorescence of this dye. Uh, at the front of the glacier we can look at how quickly that dye comes out and in what concentrations and that can tell us a good deal about the functioning and the morphology of that internal drainage system. We're, we're trying to understand the black box and this can really help us there. Now I should add this looks like uh, wanton environmental vandalism. Um, this is a dye called rhodamine. It does photodegrade very rapidly and uh, it leaves no residue in the natural environment. So although this looks pretty shocking, uh, it is actually a very benign uh, technique. Now this is just one example of how we might interpret um, the um, output from our fluorometer, which is this device down here, uh, where my mouse cursor is this, we would anchor in a river at the front of the glacier. Let's just um, assume we've got at the base of the glacier a fairly complex network of channels um, spreading over a wide area. We've lifted the glacier up off the bed here, so we're pouring the dye in from the surface. It flows down the moulin on these big vertical holes, which I'll show you a picture of later. And because we have a complex network at the bed of the glacier, that dye spreads out around three different flow pathways. And so consequently, that sort of complex network would give us an output from the fluorometer, uh, which is also complex, a, a multi-peaked graph uh, with the different parcels of dye that have gone through the different routes coming out at the front of the glacier at different times. Now I've just summarized you know, several decades of fluorometry research in one slide, but that's really just to give you the 
uh, general picture uh, of the technique to conceptualize the technique uh, clearly you can imagine if that was a straight channel from the left of the screen to the right of the screen uh, you would get a very much simpler output from the fluorometer and that would allow us to uh, make some uh, draw some conclusions about the, the shape the morphology uh, of those channels and how quickly water moves through but the real um, way to work out what's going in, on in the black box is to actually get inside the black box and this is what I did uh, with colleagues from Aberystwyth in 2016 and repeat experiments uh, the year before that uh, and I believe future work is also going to take place we laser scanned the interior of the glacier to get a detailed map in three dimensions of that internal hydrological system, that internal black box. Now this picture shows the laser, laser scanner, it is just a normal terrestrial laser scanner, extraordinarily expensive and the reason we've got it uh, on the tripod down by the beach is because you have to tell it where it is on the Earth's surface, it has to you know, become self-aware if you like, uh, aware of its own locations. Um, before we lower it down the, the glacier where obviously we're away from any sort of GPS signal. Um, so down at sea level we know we're at sea level um, and I've just also put this picture in because it shows Neolisund again this is looking out into the fields but again this is taken in March so at the same time of year as the previous photo earlier on in the presentation and as you can see there is absolutely no sea ice there at all uh, my colleague um, is uh, not exactly dressed for deep arctic weather so it was extremely mild uh, considering our very northerly location but the lack of sea ice is, is really telling um, and, and is, is a very visual example of how quickly things are changing in this region so um, this is probably the maddest project I've ever been involved in but uh, what was involved was setting up some anchors so digging through the snow about a meter of snow uh, installing ice screws into the uh, ice surface and then uh, abseiling off down uh, a moulin these are vertical shafts that uh, drop into the glacier and normally in summer they would channel large amounts of water into the hydrological system uh, but in winter uh, water is pretty much absent or, or if present in very small volumes so it's, it's relatively safe uh, to do this uh, so here's my, uh, me uh, gingerly working my way down this moulin I don't mind admitting it was it was in equal measures uh, spectacular and absolutely terrifying um, particularly as you hear the ice crack on occasions which uh, really uh, startles you but here we are about halfway down putting a putting a brave face on it um, and again looking up from that location uh, back up to the surface and of course you need to feel some pity for the poor person on the surface because we have to have somebody on the surface at all times in case any polar bears happen to wander past um, and it's an awful lot colder on the surface than it is down in the the depths of the, the glacier so here's the laser scanner on a tripod um, the targets you can see the checkerboard targets on the walls are used to stitch the scenes together because the scanner generates millions of points uh, point clouds um, and we are obviously moving progressively through the hydrological system within the glacier and so we have to stitch uh, several, you know, clouds together to make a larger three-dimensional visualization on the 3D map of the internal hydrological system so that's what those targets are there for we have the target in view uh, and we have overlapping scans with the same target in view so we can stitch them together uh, knowing exactly where the overlap is. I should have po also point out that you might see the uh, uh, scanner here is black rather than blue well the reason for that is we had to 
uh, make a little neoprene coat for it. Uh, the batteries didn't like the cold, so uh, a neoprene coat was uh, devised. That didn't really help much, so um, we then put in some of those chemical hand warmer sachets. Um, that helped a little bit, but still not enough, and so eventually we had to resort to hugging the wretched thing uh, in our duvet jackets until it got sufficiently warm. Uh, put it on the tripod quickly, press the button, let it do its thing, uh, and then uh, fresh batteries uh, for round two. So it needed quite a bit of uh, TLC. Uh, here's a view of one of the subglacial channels. This is coming out towards the front of the glacier, so you can see uh, daylight penetrating, and again, these checkerboard targets, which are used to stitch uh, the various seams together. And incredible light down there. Um, I say incredible light, it's pitch black once you're away uh, far enough from the Mulan, uh, but with a head torch on, you get these wonderful uh, textures and lights uh, deep inside the, the glacier. Yeah. And so um, what we're seeing of course is that the glacier is melting from the inside out as well as from the outside in. Um, and the channel is very much larger than we might have thought. And then we can compare individual years to one another to see how things are changing. Now this view is a visualization. We're heading down the Moulin now. Uh, you may be able to make out the climbing ropes, so uh, they're just there where my mouse cursor is, and there's a rucksack there. Um, the colours don't mean anything, they're just to help visualise, but here we are, bottom of the Moulin, and now swinging through uh, this uh, channel, which would normally be uh, discharging large volumes of meltwater during the summer months, uh, but during the winter is completely dry, hence we're able to to get inside and do these scans and um, I sort of jokingly say that uh, more people have walked on the moon than have been this deep inside glaciers I don't know if that's true or not but it's, it wouldn't surprise me um, so here we are zooming back up to the, the surface and clearly with repeat scans every year uh, we can look at how these systems are changing in response to warming so let's Swing over to the Himalayas then. Why do Himalayan glaciers matter? Well, um, really water resource issues yeah, is the key reason. And we are keen to be able to understand how these glaciers work inside because that is imperative to being able to predict the future uh, water resource availability. If we think about the population of Himalayan countries, not particularly large if we just stick to the area of the Himalayas, but if we consider the uh, countries which are fed, if you like, by rivers flowing from the Himalaya, uh, the figure gets very large very quickly. It is no surprise that the Himalaya are referred to as the water tower of Asia. Most of the major Asian rivers are rising in the Himalayas of the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, global food production, I'll come on to this um, a bit later on, but uh, these rivers are feeding some of the world's most fertile agricultural zones. Um, energy production is extensive in the Himalaya from hydroelectric um, power and driven by rivers fed by snow and ice melt. Um, and we can estimate that about a fifth of the world's population are dependent on snow and ice melt directly or indirectly for their water resources so irrigation agriculture power generation uh, etc so th this is a, a serious water resource issue uh, for future. sorry my microphone just went uh, a serious water resource issue for future decades there's also an issue with um, soot and dark coloured dusts landing on ice surfaces. Um, so black carbon uh, from China, India, etc. associated with industrialisation and emissions. Uh, those dark soot particles can accelerate melt by absorbing energy from the sun. Again, we have the common uh, issue that we saw with Arctic glaciers, that loss of a carbon sink 
as the amount of glacial ice and glacial activity reduces and similarly the same sorts of issues with regards water sediment and nutrient delivery to the world's oceans now fresh water are absolutely critical in the Himalayas um, if you've ever been there you will see snow melt is treated as a precious resource snow melt is much cleaner than glacial water because it's not full of sediment um, now at the moment there's plenty of water in the Himalayas the glaciers are abundantly producing water as they shrink um, but in a few decades uh, if climate trends continue we're likely to see those water supplies tail off um, and that, that is a really serious issue that needs addressing now um, so here is snowmel being used in Namchi Bazaar uh, in, in Nepal being used for washing clothes washing um, I find this picture incredible because this woman is washing with their hands and their feet in a river of snow melt uh, which is probably half a degree maybe one degree above zero uh, <laughs> extraordinary um, fortitude um, resilience uh, just, just incredible uh, but if we if we look at the wider Himalayas this is going off to the Karakoram in Pakistan this is the Hunza Valley um, you can see looking up at the slopes here on the right this is a really arid environment and yet we have lush green vegetation uh, and the reason for that lush green vegetation is of course due to the availability of snow and ice melt to irrigate and make agriculture possible um, and also for livestock rearing that fresh water absolutely critical um, and what we are seeing in some parts of the Himalayas is people heading to higher and higher altitudes in search of fresh clean snow patch water well of course there are altitudinal limits to both livestock rearing and agricultural production so the, these are issues that are, are coming down the line uh, for a few decades from now but which are um, beginning to be felt uh, right now and if we look at the the greater Himalaya and um, the rivers that rise there you can see the picture here we've got rivers uh, rising in the Himalayas supplying most of the major Asian nations um, China India Pakistan Bangladesh you've got rivers rising on the Tibetan Plateau feeding uh, Southeast Asia so it, it's, it's no surprise that this figure is so large 20% of the world's population approximately uh, dependent directly or indirectly on snow and ice melt um, so a really important issue from a water resource perspective and I put this slide in just to show the sort of black carbon effects this dark surface dust that we're increasingly seeing landing on the surface of Himalayan systems um, it's thin layers of dust so because those layers of dust are thin they can conduct uh, the sun's energy through them uh, and drive further melt there's a combination obviously of natural dust that we would expect to see in a mountain area but also this black carbon this soot uh, associated with uh, human activities and mo moving on partly to some of the myths and misconceptions the um, I've, I've read several media reports saying things along the lines of Himalayan glaciers are not retreating therefore um, you know what's this about climate change global warming in the Himalayas well he here's a picture of the Kumbu glacier in Nepal which runs down from the western flank of Everest hasn't retreated uh, at all really in the last few decades uh, but as you can see from these overlays the white lines um, the top of the ice surface um, 1850 approximately is where that white line is uh, and now the white lines you can see are the current day surface uh, which is over 100 meters lower so yes this glacier hasn't retreated much at all in the last few decades but it has lost an enormous volume of ice through down wasting and just to show you this Google Earth image uh, Everest is around the corner here 
Uh, you've got the famous Kumbu Icefall, my route up Everest from the Nepalese side. Coming down here where my cursor is, that's where Everest Base Camp is approximately. Uh, but as you can see, there's nothing down here which shows any signs of recent retreat. Um, but it is very clear that this glacier has lost uh, an enormous, enormous amount of mass uh, vertically. Now often when I do public presentations, people ask me, well, you know, why should I be worried about Himalayan glaciers melting that are 4,000 miles away from home? Well, um, here's an interesting uh, thought experiment. Uh, when the Brexit vote happened, uh, one of the more amusing headlines was people up in arms about the cost of Marmite increasing literally overnight. And of course, the reason the price of Marmite increased is because of uh, imported ingredients. Uh, and of course, I think we forget just how reliant we are in the UK on imported food and also imported energy. So, so the point I make with this slide is that those Himalayan glaciers feed some of the world's most agriculturally productive zones, agricultural zones from which we import large quantities of food. So if we're looking to the future and in terms of food security, uh, we have every reason to be concerned about shrinking Himalayan glaciers that are several thousand miles from home. Uh, and just another slide of an Arctic glacier, which I've worked on for many years now. Again, there's no real evidence of rapid recent retreat uh, in the, the forefield area here, um, but we're looking at over 80 meters of vertical lowering uh, over the last 20 years or so. Um, so we need to be a little bit careful how we interpret what we see in the cryosphere, that part of the world comprising snow and ice and make sure we're being scientific because otherwise we can get tied up with some of the uh, understandable misunderstandings uh, that we often see in some sections of the media. So here is a glacier which is growing. So this glacier is at, uh, as a total mass of snow and ice is growing. Yet at the front of the glacier, where my cursor is, it is thinning and retreating. Well, how can a glacier be growing whilst it's also retreating? Well, the answer is very simple. Glacier ice is nothing more complex than compressed snow. It takes time for that compressed snow to turn into glacial ice, years, and it takes time for that uh, increased input of snow and ice to feed its way through to the bottom of the glacier and push the front forward. So although it's fair to say that most glaciers that are shrinking are also in retreat, it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. We can have a glacier which is growing whilst also retreating. We can have a glacier which is shrinking while the front is advancing. And clearly the front is advancing in response to changing inputs, snowfall, from a few years previous. So we need to be a little bit careful and ensure we're doing our scientific homework. Another example, this uh, beautiful NASA image, I think this is from the shuttle, um, surface lakes on the Greenland ice sheet. These are forming, these are the blue areas, these are forming in response to surface, surface lowering and melt. Sorry, my microphone's come adrift again. Um, and this can have some peculiar consequences. So we have that, that surface melt. Uh, big ponds, big lakes are forming on the ice surface. If those lakes, the water from those lakes, can penetrate to the base of the glacier um, and pressurize the channels at the base of the glacier, then the response to warming can actually be the glacier moving forwards because that water is lubricating the base of the glacier and helping it move faster and easier. So, you know, these systems are much more complex than just being giant lollipops that, that grow when things get cold and shrink when things get warm. Uh, and understandably, there's a good deal of misunderstanding and misrepresentation of climate science based on what glaciers are doing. Um, because we need to delve into the science of glaciology to really understand how they respond to 
climate. Here is another example. This is from Alaska. You can see the front of this glacier where my mouse cursor is. This is 1963. If I fast forward two years, you can now see uh, the front of that glacier has advanced uh, a few couple of kilometers. Now that's a process called glacier surging and it has nothing to do with climate um, because there are other glaciers adjacent to this one that do not advance. Uh, glacier surging is all to do with the presence, distribution and pressure of meltwaters at the base of the glacier, not to do with climate. Uh, but of course, you know, intuitively we might say, well, this glacier has advanced two kilometers, so um, you know, things must be cooling down. No, nope, there's much more to it than that. It is a much more complex system. So let's look at some other myths and misconceptions. Um, I've heard several people say that there is sea level fall in some areas. Well, again, we need to be a little bit careful and make sure we're understanding the science correctly. If we take Northern Scotland, for example, it is still rising in response. The land surface is still rising in response to the unloading of ice at the end of the last glacial maximum. Uh, so Scotland becoming ice free in 10 to 11,000 years, maybe a bit later than that. Uh, but, but the Earth's crust is still rebounding. And so consequently, relative to the sea surface, you're going to get a very different rate of sea level rise than you might find in London, for example, where, again, in response to that unloading of ice in Scotland, southeast England is being forced lower. So the Earth's crust is still responding to um, things that happened uh, tens of thousands of years ago. Um, <clears throat> so uh, other issues, of course, we have tidal movements. They can build water up in one location relative to another. We can have fault lines which are shifting the land up or down on the coast. So it, it's really important we, we understand the science of sea level rise. We can't just pick one location and say, yes, sea level is falling there. Sea level is not falling. It's just that the land is rising quicker than the sea is rising. And of course, we're seeing an acceleration of sea level rise. Um, that uh, the, a lot of sea level rise we've seen to date through thermal expansion of the world's oceans, and we're increasingly seeing land-based ice contributing to those uh, rising sea levels. Now, water vapor. Uh, isn't water vapor a more important greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide? Now, of course, the answer is yes, it is a very effective greenhouse gas. We can see just how effective it is at trapping heat. Uh, look at a cloudy night in winter. It is water vapor in the atmosphere. Things are very much warmer than on a cloud-free night in winter. But the issue here is all about residence time. Now, the average residence time for a water molecule in the atmosphere is very short. We're talking a matter of days. Uh, whereas for CO2, once it's up on a human lifetime, uh, it is up for good because the average residence time is somewhere in the region of 100 years. So although water vapour is more effective as a greenhouse gas, uh, its presence in the atmosphere is time limited. Uh, whereas with CO2, given that longer time span, uh, we see a year-on-year -year cumulative increase. So that's why uh, the focus is on carbon dioxide. Uh, this is a headline from a newspaper um, blaming it all on the sun. Um, well, of course, solar output is, is important, uh, but unfortunately there is, is no trend in solar output that we can um, tie to the trends that we're seeing in warming. It's a very tempting hypothesis, of course. It would be very nice to be able to blame it on the sun. Um, various people have tried to do this but it just doesn't stack up once we explore the science. There is no marker of solar output, be it solar flares, sunspots, etc., uh, that we can use to explain uh, the warming we've seen over the last 150 years or so. Uh, another common myth or misconception or red herring is that human 
emissions of CO2 are so tiny compared to natural emissions that you know we should there's no need to be concerned well it is true that natural emissions to and from natural carbon sinks every year are enormous there are vast quantities of flux in the carbon cycle and that really misses the point if we look at the last few glacial interglacial cycles up here on the top left uh, we can see that what the earth or what, what carbon sources give out during interglacials uh, is then taken back in during glacial periods what comes out during inter interglacials is then taken back in during glacial and so on and if i put a trend line through this you can clearly see it's horizontal and we see much the same thing on an annual basis these huge fluxes of carbon to and from uh, sources and sinks are in balance now what we're doing through burning of fossil fuels is releasing stores of carbon that have been safely locked up for hundreds of millions of years and so consequently although the amount released from those stores relative to the annual flux to and from sources and sinks is relatively small we are slowly but surely uh, adding cumulatively to carbon levels uh, and releasing stores which have been locked up for a very long time indeed so yes the percentage released is small relative to that release from natural uh, sources but release from natural sources goes back into natural sinks we are releasing from sources uh, that have not seen the light of day for millions uh, if not hundreds of millions of years so that's why uh, this is a bit of a red herring uh, the volcanoes emit more CO2 than human activities is is just uh, false. Uh, I'm never quite sure where this has come from. It seems to be a bit of an urban myth. It, it, it just uh, isn't true, unfortunately. Um, and we actually find it very hard to pick up substantial CO2 outputs in terms of impact on global levels from even major uh, volcanic eruptions. But then even if we choose to, uh, if you like, disregard, disregard the laws of physics, um, you know, I find it slightly peculiar that people are prepared to believe in the laws of physics when it comes to water vapour and the fact that it's warmer on a cloudy night than on a clear night in winter. But for some reason when it comes to CO2, a gas we can't see, taste, smell, um, suddenly those laws of physics don't apply. But uh, there is another compelling reason why emissions reduction uh, is so important and that is the health of the world's oceans because uh, to be blunt we cannot survive long term as a species without healthy marine ecosystems um, because of course a sizable proportion of the air we breathe the oxygen we breathe is generated from photosynthesis in the world's oceans and that often comes as a surprise to people if you ask uh, somebody on the street where does the world's oxygen come from their response will probably be the amazon rainforest or plants and trees and of course you know those that is important um, but i don't think many people truly appreciate the importance of the world's oceans in producing uh, oxygen uh, and of course what carbon dioxide forms when mixed with water is a mild acid called carbonic acid and that puts all calcium carbonate based organisms such as coral reefs, mollusks, etc., uh, under a considerable amount of stress as the pH lowers. So, that fact alone is a very important and compelling reason as to why uh, emissions reduction needs to take place. Uh, we are absolutely dependent as a species on healthy marine ecosystems, and I find it fairly shocking it's only in the last few years uh, that we've started to become alarmed about the state of the world's oceans uh, predominantly arising from the very public uh, plastic pollution issue but the, the, there are other very serious issues affecting uh, the health of our ecosystems ocean acidification this mixing of co2 with um, ocean waters you know the ocean can't soak up the co2 quick enough that we're pumping out hence that lowering of pH. 
Now I'm moving away from science now and these are just some of my thoughts on what we need to do to deal with this problem. <clears throat> and I suppose you might think, well he would say this, uh, the need for education, given that he's a scientist. Um, but to my mind the need for ed education is absolutely critical because it is a lack of education which leads to uh, the longevity and indeed the very presence of some of the myths and misconceptions I've touched upon. So this boat uh, is an example. Uh, I did a phone-in for the BBC a few years ago on climate change, radio phone-in, and somebody rung in telling us that um, sea level rise was nothing to do with uh, thermal expansion of the world's oceans or uh, meltwater entering the oceans. Uh, and this gentleman was adamant um, to the point of being fairly rude actually that uh, it was all to do with Archimedes principle um, and that if we couldn't work it out we obviously weren't very good scientists which was you know fairly um, <laughs> provocative remark I guess. Anyway his, his theory is that humans have put too many boats on the world's oceans and the results resultant displacement of water caused by that is why sea level has risen uh, and so consequently the solution is not to worry because if we want to lower sea level we just remove um, a few boats. Now even when we've gone through the science of this and how that's just absolutely um, total um, nonsense uh, this individual wasn't having it, he was absolutely adamant this was this was the case. So clearly a need for education there um, on Earth systems, the volume of the Earth's oceans, etc. And even more frightening, I did a public talk where somebody actually suggested removing blue whales from the world's oceans because they must be, uh, as the world's biggest mammal, they must be displacing an awful lot of water and if we remove them... Um, problem solved with sea level at any rate so you know clearly that's absolute madness um, but these are ideas that people have and, and beliefs that people have which which are, are fairly shockingly commonplace I'm afraid to say so I do think education both uh, educating ourselves uh, but also trying to educate others uh, is a fundamental part of getting to grips with this problem now, if we look at uh, this, uh, this is just obviously a bit of a jokey cartoon, but uh, looking back over my career, I can definitely relate to this timeline. Um, for the first decade or so of my career, the, the message very much was, well, it's not happening, it's not real. Um, and then probably about 10 years ago, I guess, <clears throat> maybe a bit less, okay, it's real. Um, we, we're just not convinced it's, it's caused by humans. And so that's a line I've heard from one political party in, in the UK uh, recently. Uh, now I think we're probably somewhere uh, around here on the oops, we really are in trouble and we need to do something fast uh, to obviously avoid, I've blanked out the expletive that was on this cartoon, uh, but to avoid um, a, a pretty difficult situation for us all. Now the UK Parliament declared a climate and environment emergency and I know several local councils have, have done this um, but there's not much point in declaring an emergency if we're then not going to act. Uh, it's a bit like uh, shouting in the street that your house is on fire but then not bothering to call the fire brigade. So how can we act? What is it we can do as, as policy makers and indeed as individuals? Well, uh, one of the areas where we have the capacity to make the right decisions at the moment uh, is in planning and development. So I use an example from my own um, village, which is in central Bedfordshire, Mepeshaw. Um For reasons I don't quite understand, it seems to have been um, subject to some very large planning developments. You can see one of them up here which um, and here which is now being built. Uh, but what we've got here on the top is a proposal for 145 homes, another 100 here and another 60 here 
uh, almost doubling the spatial extent of the village. Now that's fine, I have no problem at all with that. There is a huge need for housing and um, I have no issue with these houses being built um, either in my village or anywhere else for that matter. However, what does bother me is that these are houses which are going to be used for the next hundred years in theory, um, but we are still building houses the way we were building houses in the 1950s uh, and even earlier in fact. So that is a brick skin, uh, a layer of breeze blocks behind them joined by wall ties. Uh, the only advance really is that we're now filling the cavity with uh, either fiberglass wool or uh, styrofoam. Uh, so very very basic technology and topping the box off with a thin layer of plasterboard and then uh, expecting the homeowner uh, to pile up uh, a load of glass fibre insulation. This is not high technology, high efficiency, energy efficiency building. It is cheap uh, and basic. Uh, we're also equipping all these homes. I'll use these developments in Mapuchel as an example. Every single home is being equipped with gas central heating. Uh, there is no solar power planned. There is no ground source heat pumps planned. Um, and perhaps more worryingly, there is absolutely no transport infrastructure improvements planned to get people out of their private cars. Um, so it, it is uh, a very difficult uh, situation uh, because there is that urgent need for housing but developers and local authorities are not putting in place the necessary energy efficiency measures uh, to ensure that we're not locking ourselves into a high carbon future so it's these sorts of decisions that I think we need to be taking very seriously now uh, and yes we do need to be building but we need to be thinking very carefully about the quality of building and what that's doing in terms of locking us into either a high carbon future or expensive retrofitting of houses with better insulation, with solar panels, uh, etc. And, and, and public transport, um, there is a non existent bus service from Mepershire to Shefford, which is the uh, closest town. I think I'm right in saying you, you can go there as many times as you like provided it's at 9.35 on a Tuesday which I think is the only bus that will get you to Shefford. So there is total reliance on the private car um, and the transport policies which are signed off by local authorities for these developments are frankly, and this is a subjective opinion, contemptible. Uh, they involve things as simple as leafleting houses for the first two years of the development trying to encourage people to walk and cycle well previous experience from any number of developments and towns over the last few decades shows that such encouragement rarely yields the results we would be looking for um, I think I'm right in saying that in England there is no compulsion for development a developer sorry to fix sustainable urban drainage systems so that we can uh, help recharge the aquifer um, um, so we are facing according to the head of the environment agency an existential threat in terms of fresh water availability in the UK under climate change projections uh, we already have numerous chalk fed streams drying up in Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire uh, they are ecologically rich uh, but their ecology has been decimated. Um, yes, that's partly due to climate change, but it's largely due to abstraction from the aquifer from which these rivers are fed. And no matter how many water efficiency devices are put into new homes, demand will rise, but this seems to not be uh, top of the list of concerns when planning permission uh, is given. Uh, sorry, that was relating to the previous point, sustainable urban drainage system SUDS. These are um, systems that allow rainwater runoff to soak into the aquifer. And I just thought I'd put this in. This is uh, a bit of propaganda from one of the planning applications for Mepershaw, showing everybody's cars parked up, not being used, and the happy commuter cycling off to the railway station and uh, people walking. Uh, along the pavement, incredible propaganda really. 
uh, very mature trees which obviously won't exist for about 40-50 years if planted today um, and using the example of Mepeshaw the only way to get to the railway station is to drive uh, Arlesey station uh, is full at peak times now and despite that there's 5,000 homes being planned for the catchment area of Arlesey station over the next few years uh, you can cycle to Arlesey station but it involves uh, whether you like it or not a cycle along the A507 which is uh, according to the planning inspector a very dangerous road so his words not mine it is very dangerous uh, so cycling is not a particularly attractive option even if people were willing to do that so I, I just use that as an example this is one area where we can make positive changes now we can make the right decisions now uh, in terms of forcing developers to build decent properties and equipping those properties with good energy saving measures building them to a high quality and ensuring that there is adequate public infrastructure transport provision but as i'm sure everybody is aware these things are just not happening at the moment but we do have a choice here and um, given the amount of house building that is needed and that will be happening this is a very real opportunity uh, to make real positive changes for the future and perhaps a bit more subjecting one of the things that has alarmed me and I think we need to pause to think about is this concept of biodiversity offsetting which again is built into many planning applications whereby biodiversity at one location can be damaged or indeed destroyed uh, justified by uh, enhancing or protecting biodiversity elsewhere well scientifically this is just frankly a nonsense uh, it, it portrays a total lack of understanding of how uh, natural ecosystems work and work sorry and their interlinked nature it is not a credible uh, policy uh, and yet it is present in planning applications and so again this is one area where we have a choice uh, if biodiversity damage uh, is the cost of development then uh, offsetting does not offer a, a credible alternative and I think that's something that needs closer scrutiny uh, when it comes to planning applications and, and part of this I think relates to wider issues so I'd, I'd just like to finish with uh, three if you like thought experiments uh, I think one of the problems we face and perhaps this relates back to education uh, is that we've forgotten that we are just animals at the end of the day we are just animals very clever animals but we are as animals reliant on the wider ecosystem for our survival so all those bugs and beasts and flies and ants which which we don't like uh, nevertheless they are critical for our survival as a species and I, I put this slide up, it shows Chris Packham who was um, calling out uh, I'm a celebrity for their you know, eating and humiliation, uh, humiliating games etc involving live insects and this sort of thing and, and I put that example there just because it shows, uh, you know, I think it demonstrates quite aptly we've forgotten our relationship with the other creatures on the planet which upon which we are dependent and it's quite ironic that you know we've got people eating insects uh, and yet there's no doubt that insects will outlast uh, the human species whatever our, our future holds and let's just do a second thought experiment in terms of the, the dinosaurs uh, they, they, these uh, not particularly intelligent creatures, brain the size of a plum, I think is the average. Uh, they managed a, a pretty credible uh, 165 million years, approximately, roaming the Earth. Well, that's that's pretty good, 165 million years. Uh, what are people's thoughts on how many millions of years humans will be on the planet? Will we even make it to half a million? Uh, it's an interesting. Uh, reflective point uh, certainly not if we don't start making the right decisions in terms of our 
climate and our natural ecosystems. And if we go back to climate, uh, this is one of any number of graphs you could find which shows the projections for temperature running all the way up to about six degrees, six and a half degrees. Uh, and clearly at the bottom here we've got the 1.5 degree C rise which um, is the agreed uh, level at which we wish to limit temperature increase as laid out in the Paris Climate Agreement. Well, uh, we're a long way short of um, keeping temperatures to 1.5 degrees C above um, the uh, average. Um, so, you know, the other scenarios depend on um, outcomes which relate to population growth, um, uptake of technology, rates of industrialization, etc., etc. Uh, but we're looking at temperature increases, whatever, uh, whether we go down the business as usual route. Um, and you know, I, I find this graph, you know, quite alarming uh, in one sense. But but equally, you kind of look at it and you think, well, the end of the century, that's a long way away. So perhaps you know, I'm sure we'll sort things out by then. Um, but let's just look at a final thought experiment, if I may. Uh, how far away is the end of the century really, uh, in terms of our climate projections? Well, I'm aged 50 roughly, not quite 50, a bit older actually, but let's keep the math simple. Um, 2020 we've got about 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet and we're one degree C above the uh, pre-industrial average at present. Now if I make it to 80 there's going to be 9 billion people on the planet, uh, projections and unless something remarkably dramatic happens in the next few years we are looking at at least 1.5 degrees C warming by the middle of the century this is only 30 years away uh, potentially 2.5 well 2.5 would be pretty catastrophic um, if that came to pass so that's that's sobering so I'll be 80 then now if I'm lucky enough to get a letter off the Queen um, suddenly we're at 2070. Well that seems very close to the end of the century. 9 to 10 billion people on the planet, 3 to 4.5 degrees C of warming. These figures all assume no action is taken, I hasten to add, no action to reduce emissions. And of course the elephant in the room, population growth. Do we need action to deal with population growth? Do we perhaps need to uh, rethink societal norms about family size. Uh, well, unfortunately, this is a topic that the vast majority of politicians won't touch with a barge pole for obvious reasons. But if we consider a child born today, um, to the same figures, 7.7 .7 billion people, one degree C above the pre-industrial average temperature, that child will only be 30 by the time we reach the middle of the century. And worst case scenario, we're looking at two and a half degrees of warming. That would be catastrophic. That would mean huge upheaval and changes to the way we lead our lives. That's not very far away. And that child will only be 30 years old. So not even in middle age. And of course, that child will be 80 years old by the end of the century, where we have 11 billion people projected to be on the planet and temperatures again this is business as usual scenario if we do nothing of between three and a half and six and a half degrees C well taking the higher end of that scenario that is simply not compatible with um, human survival uh, or human society in the way we currently enjoy it uh, six and a half degrees C would be absolutely catastrophic. So I put this slide up not to frighten, not to panic, but just really to make the point that we have everything we need to deal with this problem. Uh, despair and panic are optional. Uh, inaction is also optional. And if we are to deal with this issue, uh, inaction is not an option. We have everything we need 
uh, to reduce emissions. We have everything we need to reduce our impact on the natural environment. But it's up to us as individuals uh, and, and in particular policy makers to act wisely now to ensure that the future for the child born today uh, does not pan out uh, as shown on the right hand side of this slide. So I'll finish there. Thank you for listening all the way through if you've got to this point. As I say, this was a, a voiceover from the slides I presented to North Arts District Council and Northwest employers. Uh, apologies for the microphone dropping a few times, um, but any questions, uh, do feel free to contact me on the email address you can see here. 